Okay, good morning. Two minutes past 10, so let's go. Um, so this morning, I want to do two things. For the first few minutes, I'll just go briefly through the midterm. I'm sorry, you're <clears throat> sorry. Oh, got a bit of a frog in my throat this morning. I'm sure you're all sick of the midterm, but we go through it. Um, I think um, most of you did, did pretty well in the midterm. Um, you know, it was challenging in terms of five questions in a little over an hour, even if it was open book, uh, it was still, you know, midterms are always challenging. What can I say? And, uh, but, you know, people did well, uh, I think. So um, I'm just finishing grading and I'll get your result. I'll email your results to you probably this afternoon, but Monday latest. Um, so I think the average, is, so you'll get a number and the number probably won't mean much to you, but the average was, I think, 72 out of 100. So that'll, that'll be graded on a curve. So that'll be about a B plus or A minus or something like that. So that's what you need to see. If you're above that, you know you're in very good shape. If you're around that, you're still in decent shape. If you're far below that, um, to reach out to me and talk to me uh, because, uh, yeah. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about, I'll go through it very quickly. So, so as I said, most of you did pretty well and got the answers and got what we wanted. There were a couple of, of a, a couple of small blind spots that I want to that I want to focus on. So let me just share my screen. So let's begin with the here's the midterm answers. So the no, question one was definitions. And, you know, one of the blind spots was actually, which surprisingly enough was most people got all of these right, except for virtue. Um, most people said right, said things that were correct, like the virtue is the mean between two vices and listed some of the virtues and some of the virtues that Aristotle mentioned, some of the virtues Aquinas mentioned. But very few people got the idea that the virtue is really an excellence. It's taking a latent good capacity and bringing it to full potential. It's being the best version of yourself. So a virtue is the quality of which, uh, the, uh, the, of the deployment of which will enable an individual to achieve eudaimonia. Um, so most people did not get that definition. Uh, but most people got partial points because they, they said things that were right. Um, uh, universal destination of goods, I think pretty much nearly you, you, most people got this right. The notion that the goods of creation are destined for, destined for all people without exception, without exclusion, and that private property is a conditional, not an absolute right, and the condition of private property justification is that the needs of uh, basic needs of all people be met. Uh, it's a main fundamental uh, tenet of Catholic social teaching. Pareto efficiency, again, I am very pleased to know that most of you got this right as well. The point of which no more voluntary trades are possible so that you can't make somebody else better off without making somebody else worse off. And as we know, and as we come to when we move on to the second half of the, the, the lecture this morning. Pareto efficiency is a very weak standard. It's compatible with vast amounts of inequality because it rules out taking a dollar from a billionaire and giving it to a homeless person because you're making the billionaire worse off by $1. Uh, so it's not a Pareto, a Pareto transfer. It, both, people are not, both people are not benefiting from it, or at least one person, uh, one person is losing. So it's a very weak standard, but it's also the standard that neoclassical economics holds up as its kind of uh, basic uh, theorem as such. Uh, public goods, again, most people got this right. Goods that are non-rival, so it can be consumed by more than one person at the same time. And non-excludable, you can't prevent those who don't pay for it from using it. That's a public good. Examples include national defense, science, uh, public parks, things like that. And then the marginal product of labor is the incremental increase in output that comes from adding one extra worker or one unit of labor. Both answers, both would be correct. 
most people again got that. So that's the definitions. Let's move on to question two, why government? And I just pulled this. This should have been a very easy question for you because it was right there in Professor Sachs's uh, um, uh, PowerPoint. Um, so to promote, if you said to promote human happiness or eudaimonia uh, from Aristotle, uh, to promote reason, live a life of reason and virtue, to prevent a war of all against all, you cede your power to an all-powerful Leviathan, an all-powerful state. That's, that's, that's Thomas Hobbes. To enable contracts and property rights. That's the libertarian idea that the, the, the state is a neutral referee that basically makes sure that property rights are, are, are upheld. That's John Locke. To provide public goods. And we already know what a public good is. That, that's standard in economics, but it goes back to Adam Smith to ensure economic needs. That's the social democracy of Edward Bernstein. To provide infrastructure, again, goes back to Adam Smith, who, you know, despite what some of his followers would say today, saw an active role for government. To redistribute goods, uh, many different people have talked about that. Jeremy Bentham, the member of the utilitarian, who said that um, government should be structured to maximize uh, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. How do you do that? You often will take from a rich person and give to a poor person because uh, you will increase overall happiness that way. Marx also to prevent the alienation of workers from their labor, redistribute from capital to labor. And of course, John Rawls, as we know from behind the veil of ignorance said that uh, you would choose a state with maximum liberties, opportunities, and an equal distribution of uh, income and wealth to the extent that the least well-off is, is benefiting. Uh, and then the John Maynard Keynes, the, probably the greatest economist of the 20th century, said that the government's role is to stabilize the economy. And we are seeing right now a Keynesian experiment with the uh, President Biden's 1.9 trillion uh, recovery plan is basically um, partly uh, Keynesian stabilization. It's designed to help people, obviously, its first goal, but its second goal is to stabilize the economy and to boost growth and to get us out of the slump from uh, the coronavirus uh, downturn. So if you had given any five of them, even if you just said it in one line, you would have gotten full points. Um, you know, if, if you had something else, then as long as it's legitimate, you'd also get get full get 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 points. But they're pretty much an all-encompassing set of eight reasons as to the the, the role of, of of government. Question three is consumer choice. Uh, I was a little worried about this because um, I was afraid that you'd get scared by a Cobb Douglas utility function, uh, but most people got it right because uh, as you saw from Professor Sachs's lecture that one of the neat um, little uh, features of a Cobb Douglas function, a Cobb Douglas utility function is the amount spent on each good is equal to alpha times your income. So if alpha is 0.6, it means you're spending you're spending 60% of your income on good one, and you're spending 40% of your income on good two. Once we know that, we know your income, you know what alpha is. And once we give you the price of each good, it's very easy for the quantities to drop out and it's 50 and 20. And most of you got that. Um, if you raise income to 1400, well, now your, in, your consumption of, you have more income, so your consumption of both goods goes up. And here we ask you to comment on the ethics of this. And this is another area where not many people got the point that we were trying to get at. It's that under the ethic, under neoclassical economics, you're, you're never satiated. As long as you have more income, you get more stuff and you can, and that's to see that if your income keeps going up, your consumption will keep going up. But remember under Aristotle and under Aquinas, um, 
the key is moderation, moderation in all things and the notion that there are natural limits to our desires. Uh, remember when Aquinas talked about natural wealth, which has limits and artificial wealth, which is money. So why here has distinct limits uh, because bad things can happen um, if you just keep on uh, having a desire for more and more money so you can buy more stuff. So that's the point we were trying that we were trying to get at there, that uh, there's a very clear distinction between um, the, um, the, the two uh, theories of, of justice uh, going on here. Point C is when we ask you, you tax one person and, um, and give to the other. Uh, this was a little tricky question. And a couple of people got caught out with it because what's happening was instead of you're not taxing the, the poor, you're not taxing the rich person to give to the poor, you're actually taxing the poor person to give to the rich. Um, and so obviously what happens is the rich person gets more money and consumes more and the poor person consumes less and you get inequality. And that leads to an injustice in the economy. That's all we want. That's all we wanted you to say there. There was uh, no need to redo the math. Some of you did. That's fine, but uh, it's a regressive taxation, and uh, it's and it's unjust in that way. You're taking from, uh, and it's you know you're taking from um, somebody who uh, has less and giving to somebody who has more. Point D. We raise the alpha, which basically says if alpha goes up from 0.6 to 0.8, then because the good is addictive, you're consuming more of that good. So your, your good is you're now consuming 80, I can't remember the exact number, was it 80% or 90%? Um, don't have it in front of me. But basically, all we wanted you to say there was if it's an addictive good, you're going to take your income and consume more. Uh, of your income and that good, like uh, I don't. Uh, if you're addicted to tobacco, you will um, spend a higher proportion of your income on tobacco products. If you're addicted to alcohol, more on alcoholic uh, beverages, uh, things like that. If you're addicted to fast food, um, you'll spend more money on that. And then you're asked in Part E to comment on the ethics of that. Well, uh, that's basically. Uh, rational choice theory. And most of you got this. Um, most of you got it, but yes or no, rational choice theory says you maximize your subjective preferences. Therefore, your preferences, if your preferences is for the addictive good, go for it. Consume as much as you want. Your tastes are inviolable. Your tastes are not to be questioned. But Phronesis says you choose wisely and you make choices that are good for you and enhance your well-being. So an addictive good is not necessarily a good choice. So under phronesis, uh, it will be frowned upon. So that's what that's that's the that's a simple point. That's what we wanted you to get at there. Whole point of this question was to show that uh, the consumer choice in neoclassical economics relies on a bunch of hidden, often hidden, ethical assumptions that we are trying to bring to to the light here and shine a light on. Okay. Question four is pro-sociality. Uh, we gave you a version of what's called the donation game. And that is a, a version of prisoner's dilemma. And that says you can give, you can, uh, you can give a benefit B to, your, to the other person uh, by incurring a cost, and you incur a cost C. So if both give, they will both get B, but they will both also incur the cost C. If both don't give, they get nothing because they don't get the benefit B, but they don't also pay the cost C. And the key point here is that B is greater than C. That's, that's how it, makes, it all makes sense. So you can see in the two cross diagonals, um, if, number, if person A is not giving, then he or she gets B because the other person is giving and the other person incurs the cost C but gets nothing. So the answer is minus C and the, it's reversed on the other diagonal. And when we plug in the numbers we gave you, 
we see that the best outcome is when both give, they both get 10. Um, but what tends to happen is um, you end up with the both not giving uh, and you get zero, zero. And here was another one of the blind spots because most people, I would say the majority of you got the numbers right. You got this right. But the explanation was a little lacking because the explanation is really why do you end up at zero, zero? And you, you end up at zero, zero because you, you think you don't trust your neighbor. You think they're going to screw you over. In other words, if I give a B, the chances are the other guy is not going to give and we'll end up at one of those cross diagonals when, when basically I'll be negative 30 and the other guy will be 40. And that's a really bad outcome for me. And both people think the same way. So both people give zero. So it's basically a lack of trust. And that's what we were trying to get at uh, there for that question. Uh, strategies for boosting pro-sociality. Again, anything here, this is a direct copy from Professor Sachs's lecture, contracts, uh, taxation, regulation, torts, laws, strategic play. Strategic play is very important. If you play the game over and over again, you can build trust because uh, you can basically start playing strategies where if, if I trust you, if you, if, I, if you trusted me in the last game, I'll trust you in this game. If you screwed me over in the last game, I'll screw you over in this game. That's tit for tat. So you can build up trust that way. Social status, in other words, very important. If you stigmatize fraud and give honor for honesty, that's an Aristotelian uh, uh, society. Uh, social punishment or moral instruction, habit formation, education, again, very Aristotelian. So you can have uh, government stepping in through all kinds of things like legal uh, and regulatory and public and taxation, or you can have kind of Aristotelian answers about honors and status and uh, education, habit formation, things like that. And again, if you, any of these things that you listed, you would have gotten full points for, uh, or, there are other ways too. Uh, you can, if you, if, it, if you gave me a good answer, you got points for it. Um, evolution and pro-sociality. Most people did not get this um, properly. Um, you were asked for any two of these things. Kin selection is basically the notion that um, you favor your close kin uh, so you can propagate your genes. Uh, because remember, not just you, but your relatives uh, also bear the genes. So kin selection says you favor your relatives so that, that, that that's how altruism developed. Problem there is it, um, it's only limited to your close kin. So that leads to direct reciprocal altruism. If you're in small groups, think of the tit for tat we just talked about. If you're in small groups, uh, you can build up trust through repeated interaction uh, with the same people. So uh, you can have a kind of a tit for tat game. Indirect reciprocal altruism is when you might not know the person directly, but you build up a reputation uh, for, uh, for altruism. And that helps to propagate uh, evolution in evolutionary terms that selects for people who are more altruistic and less selfish. And then there's multi-level selection, which is my favorite one, which says that, you know, within a group, selfish people might win out because unself altruists are tend to be naive, but with, but between groups, um, the groups group of altruists win out uh, because they can coordinate and work better together. And they're not trying to screw each other over. Um, Again, you did not need detailed explanations of all this. A couple of sentences would have done, but they are some of the evolutionary theories behind uh, pro-sociality. And then finally, the medical technology. Most people did pretty, pretty well on this one. Club good is non-rival, but it's excludable. So in other words, it can be produced by any company. 
but it's excludable by invoking a patent. Uh, the difference between libertarianism and Thomas Aquinas. Libertarianism says you own the fruits of your labor. So if you, um, the, most people got this, if you uh, produce a vaccine technology, you are, as John Locke would say, you are mixing your labor with uh, the natural resources. So you own, you own the fruits of your labor. Um, again, most people got this partly right. I was hoping that people would use the, 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 the quote from Aquinas that in case of need, all things are common property. That's where I was going there. And in this example, we said that this is a disease that kills a million people a year because of the high cost of the drug. 300,000 people still die. Um, in case of need, uh, there is no greater need than savings lives. So all things are common property. Therefore, the medical technology must be seen as common property too. Uh, and so there would be a very different theory of social justice coming from Aquinas and coming from libertarianism. And by the way, I would argue that this also applies to what's going on today with the production of vaccines. Um, the rich countries uh, like the US and Europe are hogging the vaccines when there are uh, billions of people in developing countries who haven't had a single vaccine and uh, because they can't afford it. Um, and that's a real a violation of social justice, uh, according to Aquinas, because in case of need, all things are common property. I would, uh, if I were, so if I were writing an article on this, that's the point that I would make, but I'm, I'm not. Um, and then how can government step in? Well, government could, uh, the example that Professor Sachs gave you was government could pay for research and development costs and then make the vaccine available and licensed to any producer instead of relying on the patent, which allows the drug company to push prices up as much as they want. That would boost both efficiency because more people get access to it and it boosts equity because obviously more lives are saved. Um, you know, there are, you got there, were, I gave points for other answers too. Like some people argue that, well, the government can just can simply step in and pay for these drugs. And you can actually figure out how if, if you need to save 300,000 lives and the drug costs $100, well, that's what, 300, three million, that's $30 million. Uh, you could argue that in the overall budget of a government, that's not much. So a government should be willing to step in and pay for the drug and give it to the people who need it most. Um, but in the world today, we see very often that uh, rich countries do not invest in basic medical uh, technology that benefits the poor, uh, whether it's on you know, AIDS, TB, malaria, a whole host of drugs. And Professor Sachs has actually spent a lot of his professional life uh, lobbying for more access uh, and, uh, to life-saving medical technologies for people in the poorest countries of the world. And he's had a lot of success in that. And when, we, when he talks about his lecture on poverty in a couple of weeks, maybe that will come up. Okay, that's the midterm. I need to, uh, let me, let me, let me stop the share just for a second. I need to send one quick email to somebody. Uh, just give me one second. Okay. Are there any questions before I move on to what I want to say about inequality for the second half? I see shaking heads. Good. I'm glad to know. Um, but I said, I think you all did pretty well. Um, and um, don't, I mean, the average was 72. Do not think that that was a bad result. It was not a bad result. It's just the way I graded it in terms of the points that I allocated. Um, so you can see how you did. But I think uh, I, I, I was pleased. Uh, apart from, like I said, there were a few blind spots, but I think they were small blind spots. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, if there's no questions, I am going to share my screen again and we're going to talk a little bit about inequality.
Okay. Inequality. Just, I want to add to what Professor Sachs talked about uh, by giving you a few, I'm gonna give you a few tables from the World Inequality Report, which is a report written in 2018. Uh, I haven't dropped this yet in Blackboard, maybe I should, uh, but it's definitely worth reading. It's a few years old now, but it's still a very nice summary of what's going on globally. Um, and just, just, just to start with the uh, readings. So my chapter on, in Cathonomics, um, my chapter six is on inequality. That's in the readings. Uh, Professor Sachs has a book on the American economy. Uh, his chapter on inequality on that is in the readings. That's a nice short chapter. You read it very quickly, but uh, it, it'll give you the summary of what's going on in the US. Um, we dropped a lot of readings in. The other one I would recommend is by one by um, uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, which talks about some of the social and psychological dysfunctions that come from inequality, which is a different dimension uh, to the ones that Professor Sachs talked about, which is the economic and political uh, problems from high inequality. So they're the readings I would recommend. As you can see from this, we're going to be looking at, instead of, Remember, Professor Sachs talked about Gini coefficients, which is one measure of inequality. Another measure of inequality he mentioned was top income shares. So this is the, the, the income share of the top 10% of a population in 2016. And as you can see, Europe is the most equal uh, part of the world. Uh, the top 10% own 37% of the income. Um, but once you get to the US and Canada, that rises to 47%. And then once you get to uh, Africa and uh, Latin America and uh, South Asia, you get much higher levels of inequality. Let's now look at, um, and according to the World Inequality Report, by the way, uh, the, the, the takeaway I always have is that the world's top, since 1980, the world's in the world, the top 1% took twice the gains from growth as the bottom 50%. So there's a, since, since 1980, the global economy has expanded by a pretty large amount. We can appreciate that since over four decades. The top 1% took most of those gains. They took as much gains as the bottom 50% combined. So that's a pretty staggering uh, number. And this is the US since 1980. And this compares the top 1% um, and the bottom 50%. And as you can see, they reversed places. Uh, in 1980, the top 1% had just over 10% of the income now it has over 20% of the income. It's doubled in four decades. And likewise, the bottom 50% has fallen, has used to have 20% of national income, and now it has about just over, I think, well, what's that number? About 13%, so a dramatic fall. That's in the US. What about Europe, Western Europe? Here's Western Europe, very different picture. Over since night, not much has changed. The bottom 50% still has around 22% of national income and the top 1% has around 12%. So it's gone up from 10% to 12%, a much, much smaller rise. So very big difference between the United States and Europe. Now, if we look at that broader picture of that growth that we've had since 1980, and let's pretend the world is one single big economy, and we look at the income groups in that economy, the bottom 10%, the bottom 20%, the bottom 30%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%, well, we see something, and then we ask, what was the how the, what was the share of income that you got from there? And this is called the elephant curve because it kind of, it's supposed to look like an elephant with its trunk. 
I don't really see it, but I'm not very artistic. Um, that's the elephant curve. And so you see at the bottom, the people at the bottom did relatively well. And that is the middle classes of countries like China and India, which uh, had very big income gains over this period as their economies expanded dramatically. But nobody beats the top 1% because you can see the elephant's trunk. That's the top 1% which captured 27% of total growth. The bottom 50% only captured 12% of total growth. But the really interesting part are the people in the middle. And these are kind of the middle groups. They're not the poor, but they're not the rich. What they are is the kind of the working class and the middle class in the United States and Western Europe. And they didn't gain very much at all. And so this, this kind of explains um, why, um, this kind of explains why you have kind of, uh, a lot of politics centered on the middle class being squeezed and uh, the working class being squeezed uh, in the developing in the developed world over the past four decades and the dysfunctions that has arisen because of that. So that's basically. So why did this happen? What are the causes of inequality? Um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because Professor Sachs talked about some of these. Uh, one is called skill-based, uh, skill, sorry, that should be bias, not based. Skill-biased technological change. And that basically is just a fancy economist way of saying you have a, a technological progress that boosts the returns of high-skilled over low-skilled workers. Um, so it's a skill premium. Uh, if you have skills to work in technology, um, then you will gain more. Whereas if you have, you have things like robots uh, taking the jobs of low-skilled workers, uh, low-skilled workers are forced to work in places like uh, fast food or uh, retail or the gig economy, which pays very little, then you expect a big wage gap to arise between the high skilled and the lower skilled workers. And Professor Sachs talked a little bit about this in his class last week um, when he talked about the difference between college and high school degrees. And often economists will say, well, what's the answer to that? Well, the answer is education, because if everybody gets more skills, you will reduce that, uh, the, the skills gap. Uh, the other issue there is, is globalization as countries face more competition from countries with lower wages. Uh, people often point to China, Southeast Asia. Um, so if they are in there and you know, they take a lot of, you have like outsourcing to countries with lower wages, lower labor protections, lower taxes. And again, the answer here is often seen as uh, education because if you're, again, it depends who you're competing against. If you're competing against garment workers in Bangladesh, you're not going to be able to earn very high wages. But if you're in a higher skilled industry, you can do better. So education is often, again, seen as the result of this. The problem with these two theories, and I think they have a lot of validity, by the way, um, there definitely is truth to them, but they also miss something. They miss the fact that it's not just gaps between wages, between high-skilled workers and low-skilled workers. It's also a gap between the returns to capital and the returns to labor in general. Uh, we've seen a large rise in the capital share of income, uh, capital income being you know, stock market returns, rental income returns, dividends, um, basically the income that you get from being rich. Um, and, and why do we think that's the case? That, and that the labor share of income has fallen by quite a lot since uh, the, the 1970s. People used to think it was stable. Um, 
And, you know, the problem with that is people who rely a lot on capital income are, are tend to be rich. And also capital ownership is, is very concentrated. For example, the top 10% in the US own 90% of all financial assets. So if the stock market is doing very well, it's the rich who are benefiting. Um, and why is that? Well, number of reasons. Uh, one reason is you have a lower bargaining power of labor, less, un less unionization. Um, you know, in the US, uh, collective bargaining of unions in 1960 covered 29% of the workforce. Today, that's down to 13%. And when you look at the private sector workforce, it's only 8%. Whereas in Europe, in some countries, it's as high as 90% are under union, uh, unionized collective bargaining arrangements. So simple, if you, if you take a very simple idea of, uh, well, if you're dividing national income between capital and labor, if labor has little bargaining power, well, capital will take Take, take more returns. It's a very simple idea. Also monopoly power. If you think there are more monopolies, then you would expect capital income to rise. Um, and that's certainly been the case over the past few decades. Uh, there's been lower progressive taxation and the scaling back of the welfare state. These two things go hand in hand. Um, there's a really nice book Call, I think I think it's called The Triumph of Injustice by uh, Emmanuel Sayez and Gabriel Zuckman, which looks at inequality in the United States, particularly from the point of view of the tax system. And they argue that the US tax system looks like a giant flat tax, whereas all groups pay an average of 25 to 30% of their incomes, except for the really, really rich who only pay 20%. Um, so it's a very unfair system. Uh, and one reason why the poor pay so much is payroll taxes and consumption taxes, taxes on consumption, which are quite regressive. Um, so, yeah, so we've had that. And that's much less so in Europe, by the way. Um, and the welfare state doesn't protect people as much. We already saw from Professor Sachs on Tuesday that the, um, the difference between the market genie and the post-tax and transfer genie uh, is quite large in some European countries. It's much smaller in, in the US. So that's some, uh, some reasons for why inequality is, 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 has risen over the past four decades. So what we're getting is a mixture of economics and politics. And this is important. And a lot of economists stick too much to the economics and they don't focus on the interaction with the politics. So inequality has its roots in economics, but it's reinforced by politics. So in other words, when the, when the rich and when lar large corporations uh, become richer, they get a lot of political power, especially in countries like the US, and they, they're able to get the kind of policies that policies they want pro rich policies whether it's low taxes for the rich whether it's curbs on unions whether it's uh, deregulation um whether it's uh turning a blind eye to monopolies all these kinds of issues which have dominated politics over the past four decades and all of this so so this kind of magnifies um the the, the politics and that can lead to either a, you, a pessimistic or an optimistic take. The pessimistic take is, you know, we're stuck with inequality. Inequality is just natural. And a number, a lot of like, there was um, a book that I really liked by um, Walter Scheidel, a historian, who basically argued, and he looked at inequality. This is a remarkable book. He looked at inequality from ancient Mesopotamia right through to the modern day, like inequality over three or 4,000 years. Don't ask me how he gets the data for ancient Mesopotamia, but he is very, very clever in how he tries to estimate these things. And his basic point is that inequality is the natural state of affairs, and it never falls for good reasons. It only falls 
due to malign factors such as wars, revolutions, state collapse, or, or, or pandemics. Classic example being the Black, De- the, 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 the Black Death in Europe, which wiped out half the population. Uh, the people who were lucky enough to survive grew richer because there were fewer people. Um, we can talk about the late, when you look at labor demand and labor supply, you can see why that is. Um, but so this is a dark picture. Is inequality the natural state of affairs? Well, I think in response to that, I would say there's a more optimistic take. If you look at what happened um, in the post-war era, the era of social democracy, we had a lot of inequality in the context of high growth. It was a very successful period, and it was driven by policies. It was driven by a strong welfare state, uh, strong unions, uh, curbs on financial power, uh, large tax rates on top incomes. Uh, at one point, the, the, the top marginal tax rate in the United States under Franklin Roosevelt was 94%. Think about that. It's kind of staggering when you think about it today. Um, but this was a very successful period. Now, why did we get that period of success? I think, well, w- I think there are three reasons. I think one is after the Great Depression, there was a collapse in, uh, in, the, in the views that the free market was going to solve all your problems because the Great Depression showed that the failures of free market economics. So the state was much more willing to take an active role. So I think that's reason number one. I think reason number two is you had the Second World War imbued a lot of social solidarity people were willing to engage in shared sacrifice during the war that created a lot of solidarity. And that solidarity had a long afterglow after the war for three decades after the war, you had high solidarity. People felt they were all in it together. And I think that's reason number two. And I think reason number three is communism. Uh, The Western democracies were very worried about communist gains in Europe and Asia and elsewhere. So they felt that they basically had to uh, put in place these social democratic policies so that communists would not um, gain power or gain influence uh, domestically. Uh, That's especially true in Europe. Countries like France and Italy, communist parties after the war were quite powerful actually, and they had a lot of success. So uh, non-communist kind of um, more mar- um, more capitalist, if you want to call it, parties felt they needed to uh, have policies that would mute the uh, the attractiveness of communism. And for those three reasons, you had this remarkable period of social democracy, the three successful decades of high growth, high trust, low inequality. Uh, very few financial crises. It was a very successful period. Uh, Economically, that was. In the US, it was not a successful period uh, if you look at um, the role of women or racial minorities. African Americans faced Jim Crow during this period. So it was not a successful period for everyone. But if you look at the pure economics of it, uh, it was successful. Uh, on an aggregate sense, and that all fell apart as we saw from the figures I showed you a few minutes ago, starting in 1980, things started to unravel, inequality started to rise dramatically, social trust started to fall, polarization started to rise, Um, the middle class tend to get hollowed out, Um, wages stagnated, the super rich took away all the gains from growth, leading, leading to a lot of anger and resentment and populist politics. So a lot of, all, a lot of the problems we see today um, come from what happened starting in the early 1980s, which, by the way, is why you cannot separate economics from politics, because I would argue that what you're seeing in politics today, um, both uh, in the US and in Europe and elsewhere, 
is in large part a, a response to the rising levels of inequality that we're facing. Now, feel free to disagree with that. That's my view. Um, obviously, the, the political dysfunction that we're seeing has many complicated uh, uh, roots. Uh, but my view certainly is that the unraveling of the social democratic era and the rise in inequality has a lot to do with it. I'm just checking my time. We're doing okay. What does inequality do for economic growth? Well, remember Pareto efficiency. I said we'd come back to that. Pareto efficiency is compatible with enormous inequality. So you could be efficient and have high growth and very high inequality. Also, traditionally, economists have said there are trade-offs. If you want lower inequality, you have to sacrifice economic growth because the policies to lower inequality, policies like high taxes, government spending, strong unions, all these policies lead to distortions in markets which will have uh, lower economic growth. So lower incentive to save, lower incentive to work, labor markets that are, don't work right because unions are uh, causing unemployment, lower growth, all that stuff. Traditional neoclassical economists would say there's a trade-off between uh, inequality and economic growth. The problem is empirically that has not been borne out. And the big study here comes from the organization that I used to work for, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which has argued that inequality is actually associated with lower growth and more equal countries have higher growth. Well, in a sense, that is not too surprising when you look at it against the backdrop of what I just talked about. The social democratic era, those three decades after the war, were very equal but they also had high growth. They were also very successful economically. Whereas the last four decades had both high inequality and not so great uh, economic growth. Um, so why might this be the case? And I'm just, these are my reasons, you know, again, feel free to take or leave them. But I think there are six possible explanations for why more equal countries lead to higher economic growth. One is uh, there's lower aggregate demand and more unequal economies. Simply, if the rich people, rich, the rich save more, so they spend less, so there's less demand. Very simple explanation there. Um, number two, in, in very unequal society, there is a decline in trust and social capital and social cohesion. Um, and that increases the likelihood of uh, gridlock, polarization, political instability. If you think of Latin America, say one of the most unequal regions of the world, it also has very unstable politics. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence. So. If you have unstable politics, it's very hard to put in place the policies you need uh, for uh, a strong economy. The other link, number three, is inequality lowers opportunity. Think of the Great Gatsby curve, which Professor Sachs showed you last week, which says that countries with more inequality also have less social mobility across generations. And that's because inequality of outcome is associated with inequality of opportunity. It, that is no real surprise because when you have very unequal society, the children of the rich have a lot of advantages that the children of the poor do not have. They have better schools, they have pre-K, they have good early education. They go to the best colleges. They have networks. They have uh, after-school enrichment activities. They have internships with connections and friends or family. 
there's a whole host of reasons why the children of the rich do better in more unequal societies. But the problem there is um, the people who do better are not necessarily the best people. You could have children from poor backgrounds who are geniuses, but never really have the chance to get ahead. So they, so overall productivity could be diminished because of that. So that's um, reason number four is a similar reason actually. It's inequality is associated with increased corporate concentration and rent seeking, and you have less innovation um because you have just a lot of monopolies uh, you're not really innovating and that hurts economic growth um reason number five um there is ample evidence that large financial sectors hurt productivity uh why is that well reason number one is that large financial sectors makes economies more prone to financial crisis. Think of the 2008 financial crisis, which really wiped out a decade of economic growth. Uh, and then we got hit again by the coronavirus. Uh, it also pulls, so that's reason, that's reason number A. Reason number B is it pulls talented people from productive sectors. So a lot of, uh, a lot of, the best and brightest, and you know this, you know this, a lot of the best and brightest go work on Wall Street, they go work for hedge funds, they go work for private equity. They don't work in solving problems like how do you develop, how do you decarbonize the economy? How do you cure cancer? How do you uh, uh, have the next wave of uh, technological innovation um, forward? So you're pulling people away from productive sectors towards sectors that are not really too productive. Um, and there's actually strong evidence that uh, countries with large financial sectors hurt economic growth. And again, that's from a study by the IMF. The, the last reason why I think inequality hurts economic growth is that it reduces the will and resources for investments in kind of long-term growth. Um, so you need if you want long-term growth, you need things like infrastructure, education, research and development, decarbonization, the technology you need for it to switch to a green economy. Um, this all requires resources. Uh, the problem is in, in large, with, with high inequality, the rich will retreat to their own enclaves uh, they have their own schools, so they don't want to pay taxes to fund public education. Um, they have their own methods of success, so they don't feel part of a broader sense of purpose to develop uh, the growth that will uh, feed into the next generation. So again, so that could uh, lower um, economic growth. And we'll see, you know, President Biden is planning a huge push for infrastructure the next time. Let's see how much support uh, that actually gets because a lot of the rich are not willing to pay taxes to fund that. Uh, some politicians are proposing a wealth tax. Uh, the rich don't like wealth taxes for obvious reasons. Um, whereas they paid high taxes during the social democratic era and it was very successful. And I would argue that their quality of life did not suffer and was probably even higher. Um, okay, these are a number of reasons why inequality might lower economic growth. Um, you can possibly, you feel free to challenge some of these reasons. These are my reasons. Feel free to think of reasons of your own. There are other possible reasons. There are reasons that could work in the opposite direction, uh, the neoclassical economic reasons uh, why uh, if you want higher economic growth, you need higher inequality. And these are, you know, there are, these are all valid reasons too. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Okay. Inequality and the common good. This is really, I think, very, very important. Um, I would argue that inequality harms the common good because 
in an Aristotelian sense, it severs that sense of shared purpose uh, that you need to deliberate on the common good. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One is, the, like I mentioned earlier, the rich are distanced from the broader population. They have their own means of success. And also uh, in more unequal societies, they tend to think that their success is due to their own individual efforts rather than um, um, the, the benefits of society as a whole. Um, and that feeds into the neoliberal ideology. So if you sever the sh sense of shared purpose, then um, Aristotle or Aquinas would argue that, well, I wouldn't say, sorry, I wouldn't say Aristotle and, Aqu and Aquinas would argue that because we have no idea what these long dead uh, philosophers and theologians would say. But we can say that uh, using the theories of Aristotle and Aquinas, we could possibly argue that inequality undermines social virtues like justice and solidarity. Now, Aristotle did argue that large gaps between the rich and the poor hurts the common good. Why? Well, for two reasons. One is that the poor are too poor to embrace their civic duties. They're struggling. They're worried about putting bread on the table. And the rich become more attached to their wealth than to their civic obligations. Um, they want to get rich. Remember, we talked about Aristotle and the distinction between economics, which is uh, household management in the context of the common good, and crematistica, which is wealth seeking for its own sake. So in unequal societies, the poor are struggling and the rich care only about wealth. So what gets left behind is the common good and you undermine virtues like justice and solidarity, which really are needed to underpin the common good. Now, our old friend Adam Smith had his own theories as to why uh, inequality undermines the common good. He wouldn't have used that term, but so I'm going to read this quote from Smith, which is my favorite quote from Adam Smith, because I think it's very powerful. The disposition to admire and also to worship the rich and the powerful and to despise or at least to neglect persons of poor and mean condition is the great and most universal cause of the corruption of our moral sentiments. And I think that's very powerful because I think it's true today. Does not society admire and worship the rich and the famous and look down their noses at the poor? And that, pro that leads to the corruption of moral sentiments. Let me explain why. Adam Smith argued in his book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, that we gain approval of others through having a good reputation. But he also said the rich can gain social approval without acting morally because they're rich. This is a defect in our moral sentiments. We admire the rich simply because they're rich. And everybody else wants to emulate the rich. So you act like the rich. So that undermines moral norms all around. But it also reduces happiness. Uh, because you're looking for happiness in the wrong places. You're seeking the wrong thing, uh, which, you know, go, again, goes back to Aristotle and eudaimonia. What brings you true happiness? It's not wealth. It's more, it's uh, relationships. It's meaning and purpose. Or for Smith, it's the approval of having a good reputation, the approval of your peers. Uh, brings you happiness from being a good person. Now, and this is, brings me to the main point that one of the most important things I want to talk about in this class, and that's the research of um, 
Wilkinson and Pickett. Um, and Wilkinson and Pickett are, um, it's Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. There are two, they're a husband and wife team of British social epidemiologists who have written a lot on the social and psychological damage that is caused by high inequality. They've written two really nice books. Um, one is called The Spirit Level, and the second is called The Inner Level. Now, we didn't assign those books on the reading list because, you know, they're, they're whole books. And, uh, but luckily, Wilkinson and Pickett have written a nice summary paper uh, about their research. And that paper is in Blackboard and you can read it, download it, read it, print it out, do whatever. It's a short paper, but it's a nice summary of, of, of what they're talking about. And they argue that inequality leads to a host of social ills because it undermines social cohesion. Uh, you have lower levels of civic engagement and you have greater social distance between people. And they show that the social ills that come from unemployment are very, very many. Um, you get high unemployment, you get high personal indebtedness, you get poor nutrition, you get low life expectancy, you get high infant mortality, poor health, both physical health and mental health, more drug abuse, weaker educational attainment, limited social mobility, more crime, more violence, more imprisonment, higher levels of obesity, more teenage pregnancies, poor child well-being. Wow, that's a long list of social ills that are caused by inequality. It's, and this research is really quite stunning and it's quite depressing. And if you want to like try and understand the trends, the social, economic and political trends of the last four decades, um, you would do a lot worse than appealing to the research of Wilkinson and Pickett. Um, they also, in their newer book, The Inner Level, they move, like it said, like the title says, they move kind of inside the brain and talk about how inequality leads to psychological ills. Um, so on, you know, they argue that on one side, if you lose out, if you lose out in highly unequal societies, you have feelings of inadequacy, self-doubt, and low self-esteem, and depression, by the way. And on the other side, if you don't lose out, if you win, that tends to have its own set of psychological ills, narcissism, self-aggrandizement, but also status anxiety. You're always worried that you're not keeping up with other rich people and you're afraid that people are, going, are getting ahead instead of you and you're constantly anxious about where you are in the ladder. Um, this comes, leads to a whole host of mental health challenges like depression, anxiety, even schizophrenia and psychosis. Depression is coming from the combination of low social capital on one side and high status anxiety on the other side. So they argue that people participate less in community life, the kind of community life that forms the common good. If you go back to all the theories of social justice, like Aristotle would say, you participate less in community life because social contact becomes more stressful. It's more stressful to interact with people because you have, on one side, you have inadequacy and self-doubt, and on the other side, you have narcissism and you have status anxiety. So you retreat. You retreat uh, away from people, and we know psychologically that if you have less community, you have lower mental health. And I've said before, but I think this COVID-19 year over a year now 
has had a devastating impact on mental health because we are denied those bonds of community that bring true uh, happiness and well-being for us uh, uh, in accord with our human nature. So Wilkinson and Pickett argue that all of this leads to people go to fall, embrace false views of happiness and they deal with stress by resorting to goods such as alcohol, drugs, comfort eating, social media, shopping. But of course, none of this buys real happiness, as we know. Um, it's fake happiness. Um, and the scary thing is, if you look at when they question young people as to what is important to them, um, they often will argue that things like wealth and their image and being famous is more important than self-acceptance and community values. So even among young people who I would argue are more social democratic, as it were, than older generations, but even among the young, the psychological evidence shows that they tend to look for happiness in some of the wrong places, wealth and fame, um, uh, luxury, all of these things. And it's amazing, 2,300 years ago, Aristotle had theories about this. And here we are today um, making the same mistakes that Aristotle warned against uh, all those, uh, those millennia ago. Um, yeah, so, and so it's not surprising that when we talk about happiness, that countries that are the happiest are some of the most equal countries in the world, uh, particularly the Scandinavian countries who enjoyed not only high incomes, but also good health and high levels of trust and social support. Okay, final point. That's very important. I would recommend reading that paper by Wilkinson and Pickett because I think it's very eye-opening and it's an approach to inequality that you often don't hear. How to reduce inequality? Well, there's a whole host of ways of reducing inequality. Uh, education is obviously one explanation. If you think that technological factors or globalization factors are important in raising inequality, then you want to uh, have higher quantity and quality of education. Um, one of the reasons the US was so successful in the 20th century is that it had a, a big head start on universal secondary education. And the question, I would put a question out there, do we need universal tertiary education today? Is Bernie Sanders right? Do we need free public education at the university level, just like we have free secondary education? That's an open question. Will that curb inequality or will it just benefit the rich? That's a question for you, think about it. Obviously taxes and spending um, during the social democratic era, taxes were high, but there's no evidence that growth was lower and there's no evidence that happiness was lower uh, at that time either. Uh, and we need a spending to create basic universal benefits like healthcare, education, child allowances, uh, things like this, things that the Scandinavian countries have that they pay for, but you gotta pay for it. Uh, can't rely forever on deficit spending. Also, I would argue that you need stronger collective bargaining and union rights. This was much stronger during the social democratic era, much, much weaker today. Profit sharing and co-determination. Um, profit sharing are companies that are owned by workers. Um, it's like things like cooperatives, worker cooperatives. That will be very good for reducing inequality, very rare in society. Uh, what's co-determination? Co-determination is a German system. It's also in Austria and Sweden and a bunch of other European countries that has worker representation on boards of governance and that has work councils at the level of the enterprise that gives employees a stake in decision-making. So 
employees get to influence corporate decisions, both at the level of corporate boards and at the level of management in the company. Uh, for example, in Germany, corporations with more than 2,000 workers have half of the members of board of directors chosen by workers. Um, so that's quite a very uh, good system. And the evidence shows clearly that that leads to less wage inequality uh, within firms. Um, Anti-monopoly, uh, quite straightforward what that means. Uh, work programs, um, you know, a lot of um, uh, work, uh, you know, countries like Germany during the global financial crisis managed to avoid having major increase in unemployment because they had work programs that basically subsidized work uh, and, um, and allowed um, uh, all work, instead of laying off people, um, the uh, workers were the workers and companies would agree that everybody would work fewer hours and those hours lost would be subsidized by the state. And what that meant was everybody would get to keep their jobs. So that's an example of kind of solidarity in action. That does not happen in the US. In the US, when you have a downturn, you have very high unemployment and you have to rely on unemployment benefits, which are funded by general taxation. Um, so that's work programs, uh, financial sector reforms. Yeah, we know a uh, whole host of things there. I won't get into it in detail because we're time is out. And finally, UBI. I'm not going to say anything about UBI because you're all the experts in UBI right now. You did the work. Uh, you write, wrote very nice essays on it. Um, perhaps next week we can have a debate about this, but I'm now out of time. So uh, let me. Do I have any questions? How do I stop the screen share? Oh my God. Okay, I've stopped the screen share. Uh, it's 11, 15, 11 14. Uh, so I have one minute left. Sorry, folks, but we got a lot. We got through a lot of stuff. Um, I hope it was useful. I hope it complemented what Professor Sachs, Professor Sachs did on inequality. Um, a lot of this, what I talked about, is in my chapter in Cathonomics, which is in, uh, chapter six, which is in the readings. And read Professor Sachs's chapter two. Read Wilkinson and Pickett. And if you're interested in a deeper dive, read some of the other stuff we put in the in the that Professor Sachs has actually put in the in the uh, blackboard for you to read. Um, okay. Any questions? All right. Uh, you'll get your results maybe today, maybe over the weekend, depending on my schedule and how things go with my, I'm editing my book right now. So it's a real pain. Um, I may ask, I have to do things like find page numbers for quotes that I've came up with a year ago and I've long forgotten about. So I've got to dig up all this stuff. So it's painful for me. So give me some sympathy. <laughs> um, so I'm dealing with that, but I also will uh, give you your, your grade results. Uh, and again, again, I think most of you uh, did pretty well and there's nothing to worry about uh, in terms of your grades. Um, okay, I will stay on the Zoom. Uh, if anybody has any private questions, otherwise, email, you can always reach me by email. I, I have a policy of trying to respond to emails as quickly as possible, um, no matter what the time is. So even in an emergency, you can reach me by email and happy to do that at any time you need. Okay, my wonderful class, thank you very much. Have a great weekend and we will see you next Tuesday. Oh, by the way, next Friday, you won't see me because it's Good Friday, which means you get a day off. So Fordham has a holiday for Good Friday. And uh, so you won't see me next Friday, but you'll see Professor Sachs on Tuesday. Uh, okay. Thank you. Have a, good, uh, have a good weekend. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you Professor. professor.